よいしょ。All right, we are just double checking Facebook Live, guys. Hang on just a sec. Thank you, guys, those of you who are joining us.、Um, give me just a quick minute while I make sure we're in the right places. Okay. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for your patience.、Um, I just wanted to make sure we were live streaming into Facebook. So,、uh, thank you for joining us today on the I Believe podcast.、Uh, I just wanted to let you guys know again、um, that we are just giving a special shout out, especially for this webinar, for Castle Biosciences for sponsoring this webinar and just for helping us connect with these wonderful doctors.、Um, Just a quick reminder if you have not seen this in social media or our email, we do have upcoming 5Ks.、Uh, there's a couple coming up in November in Los Angeles and in Scottsdale. And then I believe there are two Texas walks happening,、uh, one of which is in the Dallas Fort Worth area and the Houston area. And they're back to back on the same weekend, which I'm going to assume, Dr. Harbour, you're going to be there at the Dallas walks <laughs>、um, and the Houston or one of the other.、Um, and just a final reminder as we're kind of running into our topic. Make sure to join our Insight Registry today if you have not had a chance to, as a patient or as a caregiver on behalf of another patient.、Uh, as these wonderful doctors are going to talk to us about today, that registry is literally going to make history with us. So、um, if you haven't joined the registry, signed your consents, and started the surveys, then this is a great time to do that, of course, after this webinar.、Um, but without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce our topic and our speakers for the day. So, first up,、um, we're going to be covering the history and the future of ocular melanoma, as well as just talking about you know, the presentation of uveal melanoma around the world. And、uh, joining us today, I have Dr. William Harbour,、um, and he is an American ophthalmologist,、uh, an ocular oncologist, and a cancer researcher, currently chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. And joining him today is uh, Dr. Uh, Zelia Kohea, who is an, also an ocular oncologist and a clinical researcher, as well as the head of ocular oncology at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center and Bascom Palmer Eye Institute at the University of Miami. She's also a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Miami. So, as these guys are presenting and we're listening to、uh, their, just their PowerPoints and their presentations, if you have questions, please put them in the QA. Keep in mind, we cannot answer personal medical advice or give personal medical advice over these webinars.、Um, so, just be、uh, careful in how you phrase your questions and just be keeping those questions in mind. If we don't have a chance to get to all the questions, then、uh, both of these doctors have been kind enough to、uh, allow us to email your questions forward to them so that they can answer them and we'll send it back via email. So, okay, without further ado, Dr. Harbour, I will go ahead and hand it over to you for the first half of our presentation. Well,、um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And it's、uh, such a privilege to、uh, be able to talk to this audience and to hopefully. Uh, provide some uh, encouragement uh, and to answer some questions.、Um, I know there are many、uh, that, that people have that、uh, when they face this, uh, this uh, disease.、Um, and you know, really, the purpose of my talk,、uh, and I'm going to just go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint now,、um, is hopefully by showing、uh, a history of.、Um, Of uveal melanoma、uh, uh, and, and where we are now and where we're going in the future at kind of a, a high level. Hopefully, it will give you encouragement、um, because sometimes from day to day, week to week, or month to month, we don't seem to see that much progress in the field. It's like watching paint dry. But when you kind of take a larger view of just the past 20 or 30 years, much less the past 100 years, It's quite a remarkable、um, story. So, that's really the, what I want to convey、uh, in my talk. And these are my uh, disclosures. Um, uh, as you all know,、uh, uveal melanoma, sometimes called ocular melanoma,、um, is、uh, a melanoma of the eye that arises、uh, in this、uh, iris ciliary body or choroid. 
the most common uh, location is in the choroid second in the ciliary body and iris is a small, about 5% of cases. Um, uh, and so how far back can we find uh, uveal melanoma in the literature? The farthest back I could find was in 1883. Um, and at that time, it's interesting, they didn't even really know for sure whether it was a melanoma or a sarcoma. Um, and uh, uh, they didn't have even proper equipment to examine the eye to, uh, to, to look for a tumor. So um, in this particular patient, they discovered the tumor after the patient had been blind for six months, and then they removed the eye. So that was the way it was uh, diagnosed um, uh, back in those days. If we jump forward to uh, 1935, so we're, we're less than 100 years ago, uh, most patients didn't just get an in nucleation, they got an exenteration where it was thought that you had to remove the entire contents of the orbit or the eye socket. Uh, and I, it took a long time before people realized that it didn't really make any difference if you did that or not. But, uh, but um, uh, you know, that was kind of the state of things less than 100 years ago. If we zoom forward a little bit more, um, people started to realize that not all uva melanomas are the same. Uh, some people seem to do better than other people, uh, even given if they're the same size. And so it was really uh, pathologists that first recognized that, you know, when you look at them under the microscope, they look, uh, they can look quite different. Uh, some of them look real spindly and some of them look what they call epithelioid like. And the epithelioid ones seem to be, you know, more aggressive, but nobody really understood why. Jump forward a few years later, people started looking beyond just the shape of the cells and looking at molecules in the cells. And it was determined that there was a, a particular molecule uh, in this particular uh, study uh, that was found to somehow correlate with a uh, worse prognosis, this uh, uh, protein called reticulin. But um, not much uh, really happened uh, for a number of years uh, in terms of better understanding of uveal melanoma. And we jump all the way forward to the 1970s. At this time, most people were getting an enucleation. We were no, no longer were they getting exenerations, thank goodness, but uh, most people were, were getting an enucleation. And um, it, it was noticed by Dr. Zimmerman, who was a very famous eye pathologist, that people um, that de de developed metastasis tended to do so within about two or three years or maybe four years, kind of a peak after enucleation. And he speculated that it was actually the enucleation that was causing the metastasis. Maybe the surgery, you're squeezing the eye a little bit or something, you're squeezing the tumor cells into the bloodstream. Well, since then, we've determined that that is not true. But what it did cause is for people to look for other treatment options other than a nucleation. And that's really when the popularity of uh, plaque radiotherapy and then later proton beam radiotherapy uh, came along. Now, some of you may uh, remember this film. Uh, it was called Chariots of Fire. And the reason I show that is that anybody, anybody who saw that uh, film will remember there were three main characters. There was the, there was the, um, the three runners. And one of those three uh, runners in the film was actually uh, a man named Henry Stallard, uh, who went on to become an ophthalmologist. And he actually went on to become an ocular oncologist. And he was actually the first person to do brachytherapy using a plaque uh, for choroidal melanoma. And this is in England. Um, back in the in the mid uh, 20th century, and uh, combined with this this uh, uh, increased uh, recognition of plaque brachytherapy and this concern about a nucleation maybe causing metastasis, this really led to a dramatic growth in the use of of plaque brachytherapy and then later proton therapy. And there was this really important study called the Collaborative Ocular Melanoma Study that really proved that uh, plaque radiotherapy was just as good as a nucleation at preventing metastasis, but it also showed that a nucleation did not cause metastasis. Um, it, it really, the choice between brachytherapy and nucleation is really a personal choice for the patient and also uh, depending on the size of the tumor, the location of the tumor. But the treatment itself doesn't really determine 
the prognosis. The prognosis, as we will later see, is actually determined by the genetics. So by the end of the 20th century, there was a realization that primary therapy was, was uh, equally effective. To, different primary therapies could be equally effective. Uh, there were prognostic factors. But at that time, really, intraocular biopsy was very rare. Um, in fact, some people thought it was dangerous. Um, and there was really no effective treatment for metastasis. Um, so there was a very nihilistic approach to treatment. You know, uh, patients would be told, well, we're going to remove your eye or we're going to do plaque radiotherapy and then just hope for the best because there's really nothing we can do. Uh, there was really no interest from industry, the pharmaceutical industry and in uva melanoma. And that's, a, a, that's about the time that I got into the field. Um, what we what we soon uh, became aware of uh, through the work of, of these doctors and many others is that uh, it's really not what you do at the time of treating the tumor that determines whether it metastasizes. That's already been decided when the patient comes to see the ocular oncologist, um, and it was it was shown that you know when when metastasis does occur, it probably started four, five, six, maybe even more years beforehand, before the tumor was diagnosed. And so we have to kind of reframe our, our, our um, view of this tumor and, and, and how to treat it. Um, in the early 90s, it was recognized that certain chromosomal changes uh, seemed to predict uh, which uh, uh, melanomas were going to metastasize. And this was the first hint that it was really the genetics that's determining metastasis. My group uh, um, uh, uh, found that gene expression profiling was an even more accurate way than, than chromosomal markers to determine which of these tumors is more likely to metastasize. The first uh, test that we developed was this uh, class one versus class two test, with the class two tumors being more likely to metastasize. We discovered that there was a gene called BAP1 that was usually mutated in the class two tumors. And that seems to be what uh, promotes the metastasis. Since then, we and other uh, groups have discovered other driver mutations that determine the rate with which the tumors uh, metastasize. And so when you kind of put this whole thing together, we can trace all the way back from a normal uveal melanocyte to uh, development of a nevus, uh, which is what most of these become. Most, most nevi don't turn into melanomas, uh, um, but the ones that do, we can kind of track through the genetic changes now uh, that predict uh, which melanomas are going to metastasize and which ones are not. Uh, we can use uh, the class one, class two gene expression profile. We can get further um, resolution uh, of this risk with uh, looking at PRAME. Uh, we can look at the, uh, the mutations. And with that information, we can really predict pretty accurately which patients already have micrometastatic disease at the time of their diagnosis. So um, we, you know, at this point, we have very good prognostic testing that can be performed on a needle biopsy uh, um, uh, very safely. We've shown that uh, needle biopsy does not cause the tumor to metastasize. It can be done very safely um, and is now pretty much standard of care in most centers. Now, another big advance has been uh, a effective treatment for metastatic disease. Um, as I said, when I got into this field, there were absolutely no treatments that had any benefit in the metastatic setting. In fact, uh, a, a lot of oncologists didn't even try. Um, so uh, it, it, the, uh, the um, development of tibentifus uh, has been a, a complete game changer uh, in UV melanoma. Um, it is an immune-directed uh, therapy. It's not a checkpoint inhibitor, though. Checkpoint inhibitors don't work that well in UV melanoma. But what tibentifus does that's different is it directly um, introduces the melanoma cell to your immune system, to the T cells. It's not expecting the T cells to somehow learn to recognize the UV melanoma cell on its own. It actually educates the T cell um, to recognize the melanoma cell. And while it's not a cure in every patient, it, it has dramatically improved survival. Um, it improved uh, uh, overall survival 
uh, by about 50 percent uh, in this um, uh, in this uh, uh, first uh, phase three clinical trial. And so um, it does have its limitations. It can only be used in patients with a certain HLA type, which is a, a blood marker. Um, it does have side effects. It requires frequent infusions. But the big game changer is that it is shown for the first time that it is possible to have an effective therapy against um, UV melanoma. And this has created a dramatic increase in interest from pharmaceutical companies in, uh, in the UV melanoma space. Um, and there's also been, the FDA has created a fast track um, for rare cancers like UV melanoma, which is, it, it lowers the barrier to getting FDA approval and so uh, companies like uh, Immunocore uh, that developed Tibentifosp and others, uh, it's a great um, uh, uh, opportunity for them to get into the UV melanoma space to test their uh, drugs. Um, and, and so that we benefited greatly from, from uh, Tibentifosp showing that, uh, that this can be done. There's all kinds of other therapies that are rapidly being um, explored uh, I mentioned PRAME earlier as a metastatic risk factor. Um, a number of companies are developing uh, drugs uh, and antibodies that target PRAME. Um, one of the, uh, we've discovered uh, in my laboratory, working with Dr. Kohea and Dr. Lutsky in Miami, that LAG3, which is a checkpoint molecule, um, uh, can be targeted uh, in metastatic UV melanoma. So we have a trial ongoing in that space. So just briefly at a very high level, let's look to the future. Uh, something that you hear more and more about now is liquid biopsy. And what liquid biopsy means is any uh, body fluid that you can use instead of directly biopsying the tumor. And so in our case, the three that have really been looked at are ocular fluid, like the fluid in your aqueous uh, blood and urine. I'm gonna uh, talk about ocular fluid and blood uh, just uh, briefly here. Uh, and show you where I think that this is going to fit into future management of UV melanoma. So in the past, uh, it basically, you know, you, you might have a nevus. Uh, at some point, you undergo transformation of that nevus into a melanoma. And then at some point, it metastasizes. If you happen to treat that melanoma prior to micrometastasis, then that patient was cured. Um, but if they had micrometastasized, even though your plaque or your nucleation was effective, then the tumor had already escaped from the eye. And it was really just a guessing game to wait and hope that you uh, have been treated in time. But now we have lots of tools to help us know more about what's happening in an individual patient and then to target therapy uh, accordingly. So where I see the role of ocular liquid biopsy is not to replace a tumor biopsy uh, that we're doing now, but to look in these patients with nevi, uh, these smaller tumors that we're not, not sure are melanomas. We don't want to have to biopsy everybody with a nevus. But if you could do an aqueous biopsy in the office, uh, very simple, uh, very easy for the patient, um, then that would be the place for ocular liquid biopsy. And then the tumor biopsy that I've just described, that we would continue to do that in, in the case of where we are highly suspecting a melanoma or we're uh, for, uh, sure that we have a melanoma, then tumor biopsy is still going to be the gold standard to get all the information uh, that I had described there. And then finally, the blood liquid biopsy. Again, it can't replace the tumor biopsy. It's not really that helpful um, and, and at the time of uh, eye, uh, eye tumor diagnosis. But where it is helpful is when we know a patient is at high risk, you know, they're class two or they're brain positive, then we, we can check their blood periodically to be looking for evidence of micrometastasis starting to grow out. And then we can uh, look at, uh, we can uh, use the blood liquid biopsy, ctDNA, for example, to monitor response to therapy. So then we overlay um, a, a new therapy. So for example, you know, what do we do when we have a small tumor um, that we think might be a melanoma, but it's very close to the central vision and we'd like to avoid radiation? Well, there are new uh, emerging therapies in this space for smaller tumors, such as the Aura Biosciences 
uh, a drug that is uh, being tested in clinical trials now. We don't know for sure um, that it will be effective, but that's what the clinical trial will tell us. Uh, and then we have definitive therapy, which is not going to change much in the near future. We'll still have to do a nucleation in some patients, and we'll still be doing plaque breaking therapy or proton beam. What I would predict is that we're going to be able to use lower doses by understanding uh, better how to target uh, the radiation and possibly ways to make the tumor more radiosensitive. And then uh, a new, another new area that's emerging, I think it, we're right on the cusp of a, of a breakthrough in this area, is adjuvant therapy, where we know a patient is high risk. Um, we think they probably already have micrometastasis that we can't detect. Um, they're class two, for example, prime positive, uh, to not wait for them to metastasize, but to put them on adjuvant therapy. And there are a growing number of adjuvant therapy trials uh, available now. And then in the metastatic therapy setting, I predict that we're going to have more success stories like tibentiflis um, uh, that'll be both immune therapies and targeted therapies. Um, and then we can, as I said, use blood liquid biopsy to monitor response uh, to, that, to those therapies. So in summary, um, I, we, we will see improved survival in uvomelanoma with, with uh, really now very good molecular prognostic testing earlier interventions and more effective therapies. Um, we are making much better prognos progress now working with industry. Um, and uh, as I said, liquid biopsy will complement but not replace uh, tumor biopsy. Thank you. Dr. Harbour, thank you so much. This was such a, just such a clear, concise, like explanation of everything that has been going on in the world of uveal melanoma. So thank you so much. Dr. Cohea, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to you for the next half of our presentation. Thank you. I'm gonna um, share my presentation now. Just give me one moment. Uh, <clears throat> Just give me one minute here. We'll pull up the initial slide. There. Uh, there are multiple um, great questions on the chat. Actually, I was looking through them, so I'm very happy to see that everybody is being very interactive um, and participating on the webinar here. I'm going to close that. So it is my Distinct pleasure to be part of this webinar. Um, Dr. Harbour and I, through the years, we really <clears throat> like to be engaged with the patients. We like to have these opportunities to really share what we're doing and share some clear information that are both kind of, you know, empowering, but at the same time, very positive. I also do um, serve as a scientific advisor for Castle Biosciences, and I've been involved in all the validation studies that have been done um, surrounding the gene expression profile, the, um, the um, Castle test. So Dr. Harbour already talked to you a little bit about uveal, melan you know, uveal melanomas or uveal melanocytic tumors, which means the tumors that arise from what we call the melanocytes, which are the cells that carry the melanin, in, in this case, in the eye. And a lot of people call it ocular melanoma, uveal melanoma interexchangeably, but we're really going to talk about the tumor inside the eye, which is very distinct from the tumor on the surface of the eye, on the lid, and on the skin. So uveal melanomas can be um, presenting in the iris, which we can see on the colored part of the eye, ciliary body behind the iris, or the choroid. And because of that, they have slightly distinct presentations and as well incidences. So the spectrum of these choroidal tumors, it's very variable. And I always tell the patients, it's, it's very hard or very rare that we see tumors that are like 100% benign, you know, like some people call it the freckles, or those melanomas that are huge, that are really so big, the eye is already painful, the vision is poor, etc. We really see more of a spectrum, more like, you know, I say like an ombre color, you know, like here's the white, here's the red, danger, really bad melanoma, really very naive, very innocent nevus. So usually most of the things we see are right here in that middle. 
So about five to 15% of all white individuals, they will have some form of lesion in the back of the eye if they go and get a dilated eye exam. So it's very important for those of you that are listening to us here to know that after you're 40, it's very important to have a periodic eye exam. 99% of these patients, or even a little bit more than that, they will have a flat nevus, or what some people like to call a freckle. Um, about half of a percent may have, you know, or little bit less than half a percent will have a kind of that middle of the road that suspicious nevus or nevus with a little bit of thickness and then very few as you can see a really small percentage less than one percent will have a full-fledged melanoma just to show you how um how very rare this tumor is. So choroidal nevi will be present in about five to 15% of all white adults. They're associated with cutaneous freckling and moles, although they're different tumors. They really are associated with that simply because of the Caucasian ancestry. And they usually are asymptomatic unless they're located right in the macula that, you know, we also call it the focusing point. So tumors that are very close to the focusing point, as you can see here and there, they will have more blurred vision. If they are far away, they won't have these symptoms and the patient won't feel anything. They, they will feel actually very blindsided when they go to the eye doctor and they come out with the diagnosis of a choroidal nevus. Um, they... Um, only transform malignant, you know, the malignant transformation only in one to 8,000 cases. So it's very rare. However, we don't know which patients will transform. So because of that, it's important to have an annual or at least biannual, depending on the size of the tumor, eye exam to be monitoring these. So they can have variable pigmentation. Some of them are very dark brown. Some of them are kind of creamy golden color. And, and that's, again, within the spectrum because these tumors are kind of composed of melanocytes. Melanocytes are cells that, that carry the pigment, but it doesn't mean that they do. So sometimes you will see under the microscope when we study these cells, we see melanocytes that don't have any melanin pigment inside of them. And, and because of that, these tumors will have what will be what we call a melanotic. The typical diameter of a choroidal nevus is two to 10 millimeters, and the thickness is usually less than two millimeters. So very, very thin, and the risk factors for progression and size overlap, we'll talk about it. So Dr. Harbor um, helped us to revive the, or revise the um, features that were initially described by Dr. Donald Gass in 1977 of what are kind of the, the, the risks that we identify clinically in these choroidal nevi that will determine or will indicate to us that the tumor is active, that the tumor is likely to grow, progress, and perhaps even transform into a uveal melanoma. So Dr. Harbour is very, um, very good with the acronyms, and he came out with this one that's called Dr. Gass. And Dr. D Donald Gass was one of the brilliant clinicians, retina specialists, that we, we all respect from the 20th century. And he was a very curious um, clinician and he came up with a lot of different um, you know, designations for diseases and everything, but this is the one that we use. So the DOC is for Drusen and the old features and the what we call the choroidal neovascularization. And the bad are increased thickness, orange pigment, reflectivity on that ultrasound growth, meaning, you know, the doctor is seeing the tumors changing in what we call angiographic hotspots. It's that test that we do with the infusion on your IV that, you, you know, we see some, you know, like pinpoint spots in the test, subretinal fluid, and the patients that have blurred vision or symptoms. So these are just some pictures. I don't know if folks are out there are very interested, but this is, you know, a tumor that you see all of these little yellow spots. Um, these are what we call the drusen, the retinal pigment epithelium hypertrophy or fibrosis. You can also see on this one combined. And then, you know, the, the 
hypertrophy is here, this black one, and you can also see choroidal neovascularization. And the bad ones are really what most interest all of us. And those are, you know, a big tumor, very thick with that um, mushroom shape, as you've heard before your doctors talking about, and some of them that bleed, that have a lot of subretinal fluid, and they cause retinal detachment that is not a true retinal detachment, but what we call a serous, like a leaking serous detachment. So um, Dr. Harbour and I, we collaborated getting out a paper where we looked at that, those risk factors, and we looked at the specificity, the specificity of, you know, using those risk factors. And it looks like tumor thickness above 2.3 millimeters or 2.25 millimeters seems to be indicating or be a, a sort of a risk for change in these tumors. So a long time ago, 2008, when I was in Cincinnati and working with Dr. Augsburger, we looked at the frequency distribution of uveal melanomas. And I'm talking about that because I know a lot of folks out there are listening in because they go to their doctor periodically and they want to know, is their tumor growing? What is the measurement of their tumor? And so this talks about the thickness of the lesion and it looks like choroidal melanomas on average, they're gonna be about 6.5 millimeters in thickness, okay? And with a very small standard deviation. Meanwhile, choroidal nevi will be in a mean of less than a millimeter, as you can see here and with a very small deviation. However, you got to realize that more than over 95% of the nevi are less than one millimeter thick. As I already mentioned, nevi are way more frequent than melanomas. So this is what the nevi's look and the melanomas if we were plotting them together. However, the fact of the matter is you're going to have one melanoma in every 2,000 Caucasian persons, and the nevi is way, way more frequent, 130 times more common than the melanomas. So when we put it in the graph, you see here's the size overlap, and here are the suspicious lesions that really make all the people out there very, very concerned. So here is the trick thing, folks. Every melanoma that is between one and a half to two millimeters in thickness, we expect to find similarly 125 benign nevi for each one of those. And as you see, as the thickness increases, it's more likely to be a melanoma than a benign nevus. But in this kind of, I would say, between two and three millimeters, it's a really a toss up. It's a tricky question. So that's why we believe that doing a diagnostic biopsy may be really the way to go to avoid unnecessary treatment. So the main conclusion about this um, tumor size thing that I just talked to you is that any tumor that is less than three and a half millimeters in thickness, the diagnostic accuracy is a toss up. It's really, really hard. And using tumor thickness as a surrogate can be a tricky diagnostic problem there. So what is the incidence of uveal melanoma? I've exhausted the uveal nevus, you know, and the choroidal nevus and how that changes it, et cetera. But the important thing is that the age-adjusted incidence of uveal melanoma, according to a recent publication, is 5.1 cases per million individuals, and it hasn't changed over the years. It's a significantly higher incidence in those Caucasian individuals that don't have any Hispanic ancestry, and also um, at a you know uh, when compared to blacks and when compared to Asians, you can see that the incidence really drops substantially. And it seems like males have about a 30% greater incidence than females, but we sometimes question if that has a little bias because of access to care and. To Despite a shift towards more conservative treatments, the survival has shown very, very limited improvement. And some people say that this improvement is really negligible. What are the risk factors for uveal melanoma? Well, first of all, 
people that have this kind of coloration on their eye, like they have one eye that is substantially darker than the other one. And when you look at the white of the eye, it's kind of like a gray black color. This is what we call congenital melanocytosis. And it used to be called a long time ago, Nevis of Oda, because it was initially described in Asia and by Dr. Oda. So it does increase about 25 times more common, you know, having melanomas in these eyes than having an eye that doesn't have that melanocytosis. So this is very important. If any one of you out there have that pigmentation in the eye, make sure you get a dilated eye exam. That's the best thing that you can do. And the estimated risk for malignant transformation between uveal nevi is very low, as I already mentioned. And the other hereditary factors in the ultraviolet light, um, you know, it's dysplastic nevus syndrome, which is an entity that, you know, it's hereditary, and the people that have what we call the neurofibromatosis. Other than that, you know, the eye, blue eyes are more likely to develop the melanomas, but again, linked to the Caucasian ancestry. And if the tumor is in the iris, it's more likely to be located in the inferior light uh, iris. <clears throat> chemical carcinogenesis and clusters of cases, especially around chemical plants or certain areas, as you know, people have um, speculated about the melanoma clusters, those are all questionable factors. And we, at, to this point, have not found any significant correlation that determines the increased incidence of melanoma. So let's talk about the distribution. I'm using Dr. Harbour's really cool scheme because it makes it so much easier. Let's talk about the iris melanoma. So the iris melanomas, as you can see, can present in a multitude of ways. Some of them are more what we call amelanotic. They're almost transparent, meaning the melanocytes are not full of melanin. You can see the blood vessels there. Some of them, like this one, it's kind of like that smudgy pigmentation that kind of almost goes around 360 degrees around the iris, some of them invading the ciliary body, and you can see this little speck of pigment here. What it means is that this is a ring melanoma because it's a 360 degrees involvement, and then with the extraocular extension. This one, a melanotic and covering almost the entire inferior portion of the iris. And this one was one that the patient was already radiated many, many years ago, and it had a little dark smudge and then recently developed this amelanotic component that we came to find out that it was a recurrent tumor. So what are the risk factors for malignancy in iris melanoma as well? You know, documented growth, larger size, these intratumoral vessels, the invasion of the angle, and, and this is the angle. So that's that kind of corner between the iris, the colored part of the eye, and the cornea. Um, secondary glaucoma, if the patient has bleeding inside the eye, seeding, and this extraocular extension that I just mentioned to you. Now, let's look at the ciliary body melanomas. As you can see here, this melanoma happens right behind the iris right there. And these are the tricky ones because they hide behind the iris. And many times we detect them when they are very large. So there are some clues to the ciliary body melanoma. Usually people that present with a really kind of out of the blue unilateral cataract. So cataract in one eye only. The other eye, the lens is still clear. Or in one eye, the patient develops this abrupt astigmatism. The vision is very blurry. Or if the patient has these very pronounced blood vessels that we call sentinel blood vessels, meaning they are kind of directing and pointing to where the tumor is. Anterior segment invasion. So it is, you know, again, developed of an abrupt kind of smudge on the color part on the iris that comes out of nowhere and the extra ocular extension which is that smudge that I already showed a few examples to you in this case the patient had a cataract surgery and here's the lens and then you see this large tumor right behind the iris that is actually pushing the lens out of the way and that is definitely something that causes some blurred vision. But for the tumors to get to that point, they're usually very large. Now let's talk about the choroidal melanoma. 
cells that are the ones in the back of the eye, and they make up the majority of the uveal melanomas. About 85 to 90 percent of the uveal melanomas, they are really in the back of the eye. So before we get to that, how about the differences between uveal and cutaneous melanoma? Number one, you know, the uveal melanoma doesn't have what we call a basement membrane. So there's no separation between the tumor and the other structures or the access to the blood supply. You know, they don't have lymph node invasion. So they don't really go into the lymph nodes around the ears or the chin. They don't usually kind of come out of the eye like I, sh I showed you there. And usually they don't get out into the orbit. Why is that? Well, because contrary to cutaneous melanoma that travels through our lymph nodes. So you have a melanoma here, you're going to see the little nodules right there in front of your ear. The melanomas of the inside of the eye, they like to get into the bloodstream and travel and find their way to the liver. So choroidal melanoma or the melanoma, the back part of the eye, you know, does have a metastatic risk that can go up to half of the patients despite successful treatment with the radiation or even removing the eye. There's no reduction in metastasis despite the primary treatment. And that's something that we're learning. We really have to look into the genetics and what can we do to change that interaction between the tumor cells and the patient. It's most likely due to early micrometastasis, again, because this tumor may have access to the blood supply early on, and we are still looking into that. That's where the risk comes from. And there's an increasing interest from all of us to treat smaller tumors, but they overlap with benign nevi, as I mentioned before. So we have to be very cautious about that. And many uveal melanomas, they have the ability to spread and have already done so even when we see the patient for the first time in the office. So that's important. So when people ask me, what can I do to improve my chances, improve my odds. I say, be healthy, eat well, exercise, do everything you can to be healthy because that's the next frontier. We don't know how each person's body interacts with these tumor cells, how your immune system can prevent you from developing metastasis. Now let's talk a little bit more about the posterior uveal melanomas. I'm almost done, so guys, please bear it with me. So usually these tumors are not symptomatic, as I said, they mean no blurred vision, no issues, unless they are very large or they're very close to what we call the macula or the focusing point. Usually patients that have blurred vision, they have large tumors like this case here in the amelanotic tumor. Sometimes they may have floaters, especially if the tumor breaks into the retina and bleeds a little bit. These folks will have a lot of blurred vision, sometimes flashes when that fluid becomes really very voluminous, what we call very large and detaches the retina. And many patients will come up to us and say, well, I started seeing this shadow off the side of my eye, and that's what really clued me in to go and see my doctor. Very important to be aware of that. And like I said, pain is very rare. We only see patients with pain when the pressure of the eye gets very high. And the clinical presentation, we say the dome or mushroom shape, and usually the mushroom shape has to do with breaking into the retina the retinal detachment, that is that serous or exudative detachment. Some of these tumors may have what we call a tumor vascularity inside the tumor and the bleeding, as I mentioned, due to breaking in to that Brooks membrane that is the lining or the, the, the membrane that sort of separates the choroid from the retina, which is the innermost layer of the eye. And the clinical pathologic risk factors for metastasis, this is something that we used a long, long time ago, as Dr. Harbour mentioned. On the clinical side, folks that have advanced age, you know, they, they are a slightly higher risk, although our recent study has shown that really advanced age and, you know, all of these other features, there are no they're not any better than if we do the genetic profiling. Actually, the genetic profile is much superior than that. So, but let's go over these 
quickly, increased tumor diameter, increased tumor thickness, and ciliary body involvement. So these are the factors that if you have that, it's likely you have a slightly higher risk for metastasis. And on the histopathology, but this is just for eyes that have been removed, that have been enucleated, epithelioid cells, the mimicry pattern, the blood vessel patterns, the extension to the outside of the eye, as I showed you, the pigmented smudge, the presence of these special cells that are immune cells, the macrophages and the lymphocytes. But what we find out, what we found out is that all of these are, in, you know, kind of inadequate in individual patients, um, especially because we know, again, that there are other factors into play, especially the genetic makeup of the tumor. So virtually all the information necessary to assess metastatic risk is contained on the molecular profile of the primary tumor microenvironment. And this is the work that Dr. Harbour was pioneer. And I'm gonna talk very quickly, but the gene expression profile-based classification is very important. We just closed the collaborative ocular oncology group study number two, and we're really gonna show the importance of this preferentially expressed melanoma antigen. Many, many publications have come out already, and I get asked a lot of times by patients, what about the TCGA classification? Well, the TCGA classification is not really a classification, but it is a one-time grouping of 80 tumors that were enucleated, so they were large tumors. And funny thing is that they do correlate with, you know, with the prime expression. I'm sorry, these two are a little side of, sideways. I try to enlarge the photo and I missed that. So prime positive class one tumors, prime positive class two tumors, they are the two and four on the TCGA, and then the three and one and three are class one prime negative, class two prime negative. So the recent study has also allowed us to see that the molecular landscape that was proposed a long, long time ago by Zimmerman and McLean can be expressed by this, meaning the patients that are class two positive or negative would be the first peak, and the class one positives would account for that second peak um, that comes around eight years after. So that's why gene expression profile with PRAIN is still very, very helpful to guide us how can we best assist you and monitor you afterward? I'm not going to go into very much here with the genetic landscape. I think you all have heard about this before. And I just want to kind of get your attention to the findings of the Collaborative Ocular Oncology Group 2 that were very, very positive, And we look forward to being, you know, to have this data out very soon. And this is um, all I wanted to share with you. And we welcome your questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Dr. Kohea, thank you so much. And Dr. Harbour, we'll go ahead and bring you back on screen. Uh, both of these wonderful doctors have been vigilant in answering questions in the Q&A, and they have been on top of it. It's been awesome. But for the sake of those of you who maybe have not been able to read through those Q&A or who are listening live on Facebook, and also for those listening to the recording who won't be able to see those, um, Dr. Harbour, Dr. Kohea, do you guys want to just maybe go back and forth and just take some of those questions you already answered uh, in written form, and let's just answer them out loud um, in the time that we have left for the next five or so minutes? Um, I can take one here. Uh, there, there's a series of related questions. Um, somebody said, did you say that micrometastasis spread within two to five years likely took place? Yes. Yeah. So the, the thought is, and, and we can't say exactly how long in, in an individual patient, but on average, the data suggests that whenever metastatic disease actually can be detected in, let's say, in the liver, that the actual micrometastasis where it first got out of the eye and successfully implanted somewhere was probably as, as long as five years before that. So, um, you know, the, the, so um, that, that explains why, you know, just because we successfully treat the eye tumor or do a nucleation, it doesn't always prevent it from, from spreading. Sometimes it does, but we, we can't tell uh, always which patients were curing and which patients were not until some number of years later, because you know, we don't know where the cells might be uh, hiding. 
Um, they also asked about testing to know if you uh, have a family um, is genetic. Oh, uh, is there a test to know if it's genetic? I assume you mean is it hereditary? Um, yeah, like yes, for those of a, us who are parents, for sure. Yes, it's a different test than you know than the tumor biopsy. The tumor biopsy is looking at the genetic in the tumor. But what you want to know is, am I carrying a gene that I can pass to my children? That's a little different. And so you're looking at a, a either a blood test or a you know where they take a little swab out of the mouth or a spit sample. Um, it's that type of test because that's checking the DNA that's in your whole body. And that uh, the probably the best company doing that right now is Invite. Um, although there are several other companies that do this. And BAP1 is a standard um, uh, test that they most of these companies run now. And virtually every, you know, I said earlier, I think in, in one of the question and answer uh, questions, um, about two or three percent of all patients with uveal melanoma um, uh, have a hereditary form of uveal melanoma. And that's almost always a mutation in the gene BAP1, which is a gene we discovered uh, a few years back. Most of the time, it gets mutated in the tumor, not in your body. But two or three percent of the time, it's in it's in all the cells of the body. So you can pass that on to children, but that's only two or three percent of people. But you can get that test. Um, it's a pretty uh, uh, reasonably priced uh, test. I have no relationship with the company, but um, but but I do recommend it when, you know, if patients have a family history of uveal melanoma, cutaneous melanoma, kidney cancer, or mesothelioma, I automatically get that test because those are the main cancers that you see uh, with that. Wonderful. Um, let's see. There's we some had, open questions. Yeah, we have a few open questions. I see Dr. Uh, Dr. Kohea, do you want to take the first one that you see? So, yes, yeah, sure. This is from um, Sandra Kennedy, and she's asking, is there a difference in prognosis if a person is in that 20% class 2 versus class 1? Actually, I, I answered that one. Yes. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Did she I, ask I, it I, twice? It's not written yeah. as answered, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, um, so, so what I asked her to clarify, and what she's asking is if I make it to eight years out and I haven't metastasized, and I don't know if I'm class one or I'm class two, is my prognosis from here on out better if I were class one or if I was class two? And the answer is, I don't think we really know. Because even though the risk of metastasis is much higher for class two, most of them will have metastasized within the first five years. Whereas those with class one tumors have a much lower risk, but they're more likely to metastasize later, you know, yes. from seven to 15 years out. So I told, uh, to re uh, I told Tessa, I was going to look at the CO2 data and see if I could answer that question. But I think it's a great question that we don't know the answer to. Yeah, especially because a few years back, we weren't testing for PRAIN. And we think that yeah. the class 1A and 1B is not as discriminating now that we know. And, and again, folks, it's, it's you know, we, we work every day in the lab and Dr. Harbour has been a pioneer. We're trying to find more answers. And obviously every single year that goes by, we learn a little bit more, a little bit more. And it's yeah. an ongoing, you know, Kind of kind of labor of love really because yeah. we don't have all the answers we're trying to learn but let me tell you for those of us dr harbour and i we've been doing ocular oncology for more than 25 years when we started out we knew nothing really we were just looking at tumors we were looking at size we we're plotting these crazy graphs you know and trying to predict risk and based on just kind of how the tumor looked and now we know that the looks can be very deceiving, like yeah. everything else in life. Let's, so yeah, yeah. Go ahead. there's a couple. Uh, the, the, a couple of the uh, people in the question and answer have talked about uh, metastasis in a class one tumor, or class one A in particular. And while I can't speak to an, an individual patient, um, you know, I think the way to think about the genetics is is, is that they are. Pre, they are risk factors, you know. So if you're class two preem positive, there's a 20% chance you won't metastasize. 
you know, and, and uh, you know, so there, uh, and, and on the other, uh, conversely, if you're class one, class one A prime negative, yeah, there's still a 5% chance that you could metastasize. So these are risk stratifiers, but they're not guarantees of a bad outcome or of a good outcome. The way to think about it is they, the genetics um, have something to do with the odds of something happening. So the, uh, the example I give my patients is if you asked a 10 year old kid and you asked Michael Jordan to sink a basket from half court, for those of you who knew basketball, um, you know, that 10 year old kid might actually sink the basket, but he'd probably have to shoot it 200 times. Whereas if you ask Michael Jordan, he'd probably get it on the first or second try. So it's not, you know, it's not that the five-year-old, the 10-year-old could never, ever sink the basket. It's just a lot less likely than Michael Jordan sinking the basket. Do you want to take the next one, uh, Dr. Kohea? Does tumor vasculature lead to yeah, greater I was, metastasis? I was typing. Yeah, um, I said that, you know, we don't really see a direct, direct correlation, but usually tumor vascularity indicates the tumor is probably growing. And, you know, and usually we see this tumor vascularity in larger tumors, but we don't really see a direct correlation because we do have large, mid, medium to large tumors that have tumor vascularity and that never develop metastasis. And we have little ones that sometimes we cannot detect that vascularity on the ultrasound at baseline and they eventually do. They're class two tumors, sometimes brain positive, and unfortunately they do develop metastasis. So there's not, not a direct correlation. I would agree with that. Um, and there's a question about um, how old is advanced age? Well, the older I get, the <laughs> higher that number gets. Uh, right now, that number's about <laughs> That's 90. That's good. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, but, I uh, think it's I important think that, to, to share that, well, with the Oh, go ahead. I was going mean, to say that the audience say, should know. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, all I was going to say is that, uh, again, it's not like, gee, if you're 59, you're great, you're fine. But if you're 60, you're going to have a bad outcome. It's more of a, a gradient, right? Um, but I, I think that the age part has a lot to do with your immune system, too. You know, that, um, you know, and that's the part that's hard to measure. And I put that in some of my replies. Your immune system, it's really this dance between the cancer trying to outsmart your immune system and your immune system trying to catch the cancer. And that's what some of these mutations, the, you know, the BAP1 mutation, the PRAME, they're helping the tumor to outsmart your immune system. But, you know, older, the older we get, unfortunately, our immune systems aren't as effective. So I think that's probably the main factor of, of, of aging. What, what do you say, Dr. Kohea? Yeah, the same thing. And and what I was going to comment that we kept dancing around each other, just like the tumor and the host, you know, and the patient. But uh, it's, it's interesting when um, folks look at age in the European patients, it seems to be a more significant thing than for us, for the American patients, right? So our counterparts in Europe, they really think that age is a significant risk, especially for folks that are aging. 85 and older, that's the age that they usually list for us. But here, when we looked at the data, the big data of the collaborative ocular oncology group, it seems like age is not at, as determining factor as it is for them. So that's just what I wanted to complete, you know, kind of yeah. kind of put there. And if I there can- There's a question of- Oh, I, was, I think I'm gonna reference the same question you were, the, the one about age and the Facebook groups and how we're seeing younger and younger people. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that there's not been a trend towards younger people, um, you know, getting it more frequently um, uh, over any studies that I've seen. But I think it's just younger people are more likely to be on on the Internet, you know, on, yeah. on um, social media and, and so forth. Yeah, exactly. yeah, and I think that we are diagnosing these a lot earlier because people are understanding, you know, the need to have a dilated eye exam. And I repeat it a few times because I'm kind of using this opportunity to just give a shout out, you know, to all of you guys. When you get an eye exam, make sure you get a dilated eye exam. If you're not seeing an ophthalmologist, but you're seeing an optometrist, make sure you get that wide field fundus photograph. That's the best thing you can do to really find out what's in the back of your eye and how can that impact your overall health? So that was um, um, a question. 
a question that question came about in. Whether, yeah, rate, can radiation affect the biopsy result? And, it, uh, the, and, and if, it, if it's done uh, immediately after radiation, the answer is probably no. But if you try to biopsy it a year later, yes. Um, and that's true for chromosomal testing as well. There's been some claims that chromosome testing isn't affected by radiation. That's not really true. Um, if, uh, you know, because after three, four, five, six months, half of the cells in that tumor are no longer tumor cells, they're immune cells that have come into the tumor to try to um, scar it down. So it's going to, so if, it, if it's done immediately after uh, radiation, then, then it should be okay, but not, not months uh, later. Um, another question about, are there any at new adjuvant treatment research uh, that's going on? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, there are, um, you know, there are both targeted molecular therapies that are, that are being looked at um, as well as uh, new uh, immune therapies. Um, and, um, you know, I, I answered one question earlier, Tabentifus is going to be looked at in the adjuvant setting. Um, there are uh, other, uh, you know, PRAIM, there's a, a PRAIM-directed uh, therapy made by the same company as Aminocor. Uh, that will probably eventually be looked at in the, in the adjuvant setting. There are targeted therapies. Uh, there's um, this new drug from IDEA um, uh, that um, uh, Darrow uh, is what they call it. Uh, and um, that will be looked at uh, pretty soon in the adjuvant setting. We, uh, I think both of our centers here in Dallas and in Miami will be um, in that yes. um, trial. That will be a neoadjuvant uh, trial. So there are those and, and a number of others um, that... Yeah. Uh, uh, that will be coming on. Um, are there any studies in people with autoimmune disease and uvo melanoma? Not that I know of that have been no. specific, although it's been yeah. looked at. Is there, you know, is, are, they, are those folks more? And, and also people with immune suppression. Uh, they, it has been looked at, not in a comprehensive way, but it doesn't, it, you would think that it would um, portend a worse prognosis, per, perhaps, but it doesn't seem to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's finish up. Yes, the, the cluster in North Carolina, it is true. They have not solved that mystery yet. And then the really quick here, I'd like to hear about um, our experience um, about extreme dietary changes per um, Ms. Bender's question. Yeah, we don't have that information, but I have seen, you know, anecdotally, patients that have changed their diet, that have started having healthier habits and everything. Um, not only they do better in terms of their overall health, it seems like they do tend to develop metastasis much later if they do. And if they do, they are much more equipped to have these treatments, these new treatments that we have. The healthier you are, the better off you are. So, you know, folks, no smoking, try to have a healthy diet, try to exercise. All of these are very important things. And then finally, I think the question about the anti-VEGF, the Avastin injections um, have been positive. I, I think Dr. Harbour probably agrees with me that yes, we have seen that, you know, starting for those tumors that are close to the nerve and close to the macula, if you start doing those um, injections every two months for the first two years after the radiation, it really minimizes the amount of vision loss. It's not 100%, doesn't work for everybody. We got to understand that because the dose of radiation really impacts that result, but it definitely helps and it definitely minimizes that damage. So I think that's it, right? Yeah, wonderful. You guys, this has been marvelous. Um, and I think our audience on Facebook is agreeing that this has been exceptionally helpful, very clear, very easy to understand. You guys do such a great job of just breaking this down. Um, we're so appreciative of you and your time. And uh, we want to be respectful of that time as well. So for those of you who are listening, thank you for joining us. For those of you listening to the recording, please feel free to send us your questions. And um, we will also make the slides available. They will be visible via YouTube, as well as we'll make the slide files available if possible. And we'll make the Q&A, um, anything that was typed out, we'll make that available as well with the transcript. So best thank you both. to all of you. Yes, yes thank you so much. Absolutely. Have a good day, you guys. All the best. Take care. Take care. Bye.